Chapter One of A German Deserter's War Experience. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter One Marching into Belgium. At the end of July, our garrison at Koblenz was feverishly agitated. Part of our men were seized by an indescribable enthusiasm, others became subject to a feeling of great depression. The declaration of war was in the air. I belonged to those who were depressed for I was doing my second year of military service, and was to leave the barracks in six weeks' time. Instead of the long-wished-for return home, war was facing me. Also, during my military service, I had remained the anti-militarist I had been before. I could not imagine what interest I could have in the mass murder, and I also pointed out to my comrades that under all circumstances war was the greatest misfortune that could happen to humanity. Our sapper battalion, number 30, had been in feverish activity five days before the mobilization. Work was being pushed on day and night, so that we were fully prepared for war already on the 23rd of July, and on the 30th of July there was no person in our barracks who doubted that war would break out. Moreover, there was the suspicious amiability of the officers and sergeants, which excluded any doubt that any one might still have had. Officers who had never before replied to the salute of a private soldier now did so with the utmost attention. Cigars and beer were distributed in those days by the officers with great uncommon liberality, so that it was not surprising that many soldiers were scarcely ever sober and did not realize the seriousness of the situation. But there were also others. There were soldiers who also in those times of good humor and the grinning comradeship of officer and soldier could not forget that in military service they had often been degraded to the level of brutes, and who now thought with bitter feelings that an opportunity might perhaps be offered in order to settle accounts. The order of mobilization became known on the 1st of August, and the following day was decided upon as the real day of mobilization. But without awaiting the arrival of the reserves, we left our garrison town on August 1st. Who was to be our enemy, we did not know. Russia was for the present the only country against which war had been declared. We marched through the streets of the town to the station between crowds of people numbering many thousands. Flowers were thrown at us from every window. Everybody wanted to shake hands with the departing soldiers. All the people, even soldiers, were weeping. Many marched arm in arm with their wife or sweetheart. The music played songs of leave-taking. People cried and sang at the same time. Entire strangers, men and women, embraced and kissed each other, men embraced men and kissed each other. It was a real witch's sabbath of emotion. Like a wild torrent, that emotion carried away the whole assembled humanity. Nobody, not even the strongest and most determined spirit, could resist that ebullition of feeling. But all that was surpassed by the taking leave at the station, which we reached after a short march. Here, final adieus had to be said. Here the separation had to take place. I shall never forget that leave-taking, however old I may grow to be. Desperately many women clung to their men. Some had to be removed by force. Just as if they had suddenly had a vision of the fate of their beloved ones, as if they were beholding the silent graves in foreign lands in which those poor nameless ones were to be buried, they sought to cling fast to their possession, to retain what already no longer belonged to them. Finally, that too was over. We had entered a train that had been kept ready, and had made ourselves comfortable in our cattle trucks. Darkness had come, and we had no light in our comfortable sixth-class carriages. The train moved slowly down the Rhine. It went along without any great shaking, and some of us were seized by a worn-out feeling after those days of great excitement. Most of the soldiers lay with their heads on their knapsacks and slept. Others again tried to pierce the darkness, as if attempting to look into the future. Still others drew stealthily a photo out of their breast pocket, and only a very small number of us spent the time by debating our point of destination. Where are we going to? Well, where? Nobody knew it. At last, after long, infinitely long hours, the train came to a stop. After a night of quiet, slow riding, we were at A. La Chapelle, what were we doing at Aix la chapelle We did not know, and the officers only shrugged their shoulders when we asked them. 
After a short interval, the journey proceeded, and on the evening of the 2nd of August we reached a farm in the neighborhood of the German and Belgian frontier, near Erbestal. Here our company was quartered in a barn. Nobody knew what our business was at the Belgian frontier. In the afternoon of the 3rd of August, reservists arrived, and our company was brought to its war strength. We had still no idea concerning the purpose of our being sent to the Belgian frontier, and that evening we lay down on our bed of straw with a forced tranquillity of mind. Something was sure to happen soon, to deliver us from that oppressive uncertainty. How few of us thought that for many it would be the last night to spend on German soil. A subdued signal of alarm fetched us out of our, quote, beds, at three o'clock in the morning. The company assembled, and the captain explained to us the war situation. He informed us that we had to keep ready to march, that he himself was not yet informed about the direction. Scarcely half an hour later, fifty large traction motors arrived and stopped in the road before our quarters. But the drivers of these wagons, too, knew no particulars and had to wait for orders. The debate about our nearest goal was resumed. The orderlies, who had snapped up many remarks of the officers, ventured the opinion that we would march into Belgium the very same day. Others contradicted them. None of us could know anything for certain, but the order to march did not arrive, and in the evening all of us could lie down again on our straw. But it was a short rest. At one o'clock in the morning an alarm aroused us again, and the captain honored us with an address. He told us we were at war with Belgium that we should acquit ourselves as brave soldiers, earn iron crosses, and do honor to our German name. Then he continued somewhat as follows. We are making war only against the armed forces, that is, the Belgian army. The lives and property of civilians are under the protection of international treaties, international law. But you soldiers must not forget that it is your duty to defend your lives as long as possible for the protection of your fatherland, and to sell them as dearly as possible. We want to prevent useless shedding of blood as far as civilians are concerned, but I want to remind you that a too great considerateness borders on cowardice, and cowardice in face of the enemy is punished very severely. After that, quote, humane speech by our captain, we were laden into the automobiles and crossed the Belgian frontier on the morning of August 5th. In order to give special solemnity to that historical moment, we had to give three cheers. At no other moments the fruits of military education have presented themselves more clearly before my mind. The soldier is told, the Belgian is your enemy, and he has to believe it. The soldier, the workman in uniform, had not known till then who was his enemy. If they had told us, the Hollander is your enemy, we would have believed that too. We would have been compelled to believe it, and would have shot him by order. We, the German citizens in uniform, must not have an opinion of our own must have no thoughts of our own, for they give us our enemy and our friend according to requirements, according to the requirements of their own interests. The Frenchman, the Belgian, the Italian, is your enemy. Never mind, shoot as we order, and do not bother your head about it. You have duties to perform, perform them, and for the rest, cut it out. Those were the thoughts that tormented my brain when we crossed the Belgian frontier and to console myself and so as to justify before my own conscience the murderous trade that had been thrust upon me, I tried to persuade myself that, though I had no fatherland to defend, I had to defend a home and protect it from devastation. But it was a weak consolation and did not even outlast the first few days. Traveling in the fairly quick motor cars, we reached, towards eight o'clock in the morning, our preliminary destination, a small but pretty village. The inhabitants of the villages which we had passed stared at us in speechless astonishment, so that we all had the impression that those peasants for the most part did not know why we had come to Belgium. They had been roused from their sleep, and, half-dressed, they gazed from their windows after our automobiles. After we had stopped and alighted, the peasants of that village came up to us without any reluctance, offered us food, and brought us coffee, bread, meat, etc., as the field kitchen had not arrived, we were glad to receive those kindly gifts of the, quote, enemy. The more so, because those fine fellows absolutely refused any payment. They told us the Belgian soldiers had left, for where they did not know. After a short rest, we continued our march, and the motor cars went back. 
We had scarcely marched for an hour when cavalry, dragoons, and hussars overtook us and informed us that the Germans were marching forward in the whole neighborhood, and that cyclist companies were close on our heels. That was comforting news, for we no longer felt lonely and isolated in this strange country. Soon after the troop of cyclists really came along. It passed us quickly and left us by ourselves again. Words of anger were to be heard now. All the others were able to ride, but we had to walk. What we always had considered as a matter of course was now suddenly felt by us to be a great injustice. And though our scolding and anger did not help us in the least, it turned our thoughts from the heaviness of the monkey, that is, knapsack, which rested like a leaden weight on our backs. The heat was oppressive. The perspiration issued from every pore. The new and hard leather straps, the new stiff uniforms, rubbed against many parts of the body and made them sore, especially around the waist. With great joy, we therefore hailed the order that came at two o'clock in the afternoon, to halt before an isolated farm and rest in the grass. End of chapter 1